Live from Case at 12, the night beat starts right now. If there is a community of many colors here in the Alamo City with racism declared as a public health crisis by the city council, what's next for San Antonio? Tonight we're going to hear from local leaders and those who have called the city home for decades. Coming up, but first. Breaking news surrounding the Brianna Taylor case. Two Louisville officers shot amid protests in that Kentucky city tonight. Within the last 45 minutes, police did confirm one of those officers was in surgery. The other described as being alert and stable. Both injuries are being described as non life threatening. One suspect is in custody in that shooting. Police say the officers were responding to a call for shots fired earlier this evening when they were hit. A line of law enforcement was seen in Louisville's downtown tonight where protesters were gathered. Today's protests began after a grand jury indicted one of three officers involved in the shooting that killed Breonna Taylor. There were no charges pertaining to her death. Instead, former officer Brett Hankison accused of violating police department policy, firing without a line of sight. Tonight, he is out of jail on a $15,000 bond. Taylor's boyfriend says he fired a warning shot from his legally owned gun, saying he did not hear police announce themselves when a search warrant was executed and officers opened fire, killing Brianna Taylor. The FBI says they are looking into all aspects of Taylor's case and also consulting with the Justice Department. They want to know if the search warrant officers used was legal. Well, here at home, a drop in COVID-19 patients in the hospital. Mayor Ron Nuremberg saying it appears Bear County is experiencing a plateau in the numbers, but health officials continue to remain vigilant. Tonight, 288 COVID-19 patients are in the hospital. That's a decrease in five since yesterday. 87 people are in the intensive care unit. Excuse me, 228 people are currently in, inten are in the hospital. 87 people in intensive care. 41 are on ventilators. 155 new COVID-19 cases were confirmed today, but no new deaths were reported today. The positivity rate did tick up slightly this week, so you are reminded to continue wearing your mask in public and also remain six feet apart from others. And when it comes to reopening Texas, selling koozies, t-shirts, shot glasses is actually allowing some bars to keep their business alive. Under the rules by the Texas Alcohol and Beverage Commission, 51% of the sales have to come from something other than alcohol. The night team's Patty Santos tells us businesses are getting creative. There's so many businesses doing so many inventive things that it really shows the creative nature of our business. The friendly spot is pushing its beer couture line. The one that's the front runner is, is, says may contain alcohol. Some like Brew Monkey Beer Company offer hats, koozies, and glasses. Others are pushing to go food and non-alcoholic drink sales, trying to nudge non-alcohol related sales over 51%. We have masks, yay. We have bandanas with our logo. But Hill Country Distillers says their regulars can only buy so many cups and t-shirts, so they're offering $8 food tokens to buy food another day or... Or, if you like, we can... Um send the money over to the local food bank. But she's clear to point out it's not a donation. I'm ringing it up as retail. I'm paying sales tax on it. And at the end of the month, I will write that check. I think the customers would like that too, because let's be honest, everybody doesn't want to have an order of nachos or French fries. Maybe they want to be able to pay it forward. Jody Bailey Newman with Launch SA, which supports small businesses and entrepreneurs, says the situation for mom and pop shops is getting dire. With all the numbers um, from the Texas Restaurant Association and data locally, that there's a chance that 30% of our small independent uh, food and beverage businesses uh, will not make it to the end of the year. So the industry has to push, take chances, and think outside the box. Support your small businesses because they need it badly. Patty Santos, Case at 12 News. The latest now on a burned body found on the far southwest side. The human remains found inside a scorched car, now confirmed to be that of 17-year-old Sebastian Eduardo Vasquez Carpio. He was last seen in the 5500 block of Burgate, and the last contact noted was on Friday. 
Police say days later, a burned car with the teen's remains were found about 14 miles away in the 6600 block of Calle Duarte. Investigators say they were called out to that street just before 9 o'clock Sunday morning for a report of a stolen car that was found. Vasquez Carpio's remains were found inside that vehicle. Earlier this week, a vigil was held for him. His, his mother vowed she would not rest until, until she got justice for her son. An apartment riddled with bullets. San Antonio police say six officers in all fired at an armed man, striking him multiple times and killing him. That man identified as 44 year old Victor Sanchez. The shooting happened at an apartment near Calabra and Callahan. Police say they were called out to the area for a burglary and were knocking on the apartment door. They didn't get an answer. Police say when they returned to the parking lot, they heard a gunshot from inside that apartment and moments later, a woman and children ran out of the apartment. That woman who ran out told us tonight that Sanchez suffered from mental health issues and believes he was spooked before firing that warning shot into the ground and telling her and the children to run. Because um, he said somebody was banging on the door, so he has my daughter call 911. The police say Sanchez claimed he had a rifle and pointed a handgun at them before the six officers actually shot at Sanchez. There is a, uh, a call for body cam footage to be released in this case. And by the way, the case that web team analyzed records when it came to shootings where law enforcement officers shot and killed people here in Bear County. Those state records show an increase from all of last year with three months still left in 2020. Right now on KSAT.com, we break down the numbers with a graph that also details the cases by ethnicity. That article is on our homepage. Tomorrow will mark two weeks since a drive by shooting left a child injured on the east side. The bullets hit the girl while she was riding in the back seat of a car near MLK and Bookert and then was hospitalized. Today, that child who is not being identified was able to feel the support of school and teachers as she recovers at home. These children come into our classroom and spend all these hours with us in a day, and it's a family. Our, our, our school and our classrooms are a family, so it is very emotional, um, but in a rewarding way. Some of the staff at Kip Esperanza Primary School came together to put on this parade. Teachers decorated their cars, gave gifts, and were able to put a smile on that little girl's face. It's a beautiful evening across the Alamo City. 72 in Holotus and Rio Medina. Randolph Air Force Base now at 69 degrees. For the most part, we're hovering around that 70 degree mark, even as low as 67 in Bill Verde. Now, when we wake up tomorrow morning, for the most part, I think we'll be in the mid 60s, some locations upper 60s, and it's going to be a sunny and dry pattern we get into here for several days as temperatures warm a little bit. But there are some prospects of a cold front coming down the line that could give us a taste of fall. I'm going to tell you more about that and when we could expect it coming up. Isis. Thank you, Adam. Understanding people through culture and history. A new UTSA course is hoping to educate high schoolers about the history and cultural contributions of Mexican Americans and other Latin communities. The night team's Tiffany Huertas with how this course also hopes to encourage Latinx students to go to college. I'm taking this course because I really didn't know what being Latina really meant. Or Brackenridge High School student Mariah Castillo says a new school course is impacting her life in many ways. I learned a lot about my ancestors I didn't really know. The 11th grader is one of 15 high school students taking a college course called Latino Cultural Expressions. This is the first time that UTSA offers a dual credit Mexican American studies and dual language course. UTSA Associate Professor of Mexican American Studies Liliana Saldana teaches the course online. We focus on the Mexican American experience, on the Puerto Rican experience, and also the Central American experience, and how the cultural expressions, whether it's in visual art, performance, foodways, uh, literary uh, works, that shape or give meaning to their sociocultural and sociopolitical experience in the United States. 
Saldana says this course allows students to understand their own experience. It's asking questions about racial justice. It's asking questions about immigration. It's asking questions about economic justice in our community. Most of the course is taught in Spanish. Students who finish the course will earn three credit hours, hopefully creating a pathway to continue their college studies. This is a way in which we can create a direct pathway for students in our communities who have been historically excluded from institutions of higher education. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. It's still ahead on the night beat. People paying their respects to the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg outside the Supreme Court this week. Coming up, how she's being remembered and what's now expected for the high court. Coming up. And we continue to monitor the developing situation surrounding the Breonna Taylor case as protesters walk the streets in Louisville, Kentucky. A strong law enforcement presence remains on scene after two officers shot. The latest coming up. And what's next for San Antonio now that the city council has declared racism a public health crisis? Our series Voices of a Nation, next on the Night Beat. Anxiety and depression are important issues to keep in mind if you're pregnant. Tomorrow on GMSA, how they can affect your baby's development through adolescence. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. People of color make up more than 75% of our city's population. So declaring racism a public health crisis an important move for the Alamo City. There's one problem though. The resolution doesn't come with a concrete plan on how changes will be made to attain equity for all. We're not the first to make this type of declaration. On Sunday, we explored how other cities and counties that passed similar resolutions have created change in hopes of seeing what could possibly be done here. Tonight, we hear from residents and local leaders about what happens next. It's part of our series, Voices of a Nation. A simple but strong message. The time for action is now. I don't necessarily see there being a huge push in the resolution to name the specifics of what they will do. Tramel Jones has lived in San Antonio for more than 30 years. And while she's proud of the city for declaring racism a public health crisis, she's waiting to see what type of changes will be proposed. I really feel like it's not this reinvent the wheel. Look at the resolution, identify all of those points, and let's reverse. The resolution doesn't make immediate changes or specify how they'll be made, but it does say the city will review policies that contribute to racial inequities. Glow Armour has lived in San Antonio her whole life, and she believes community engagement is a crucial starting point. I would love for them to be like a community board or something like that, where, um, they would ask people, what what do you want and how how can we help facilitate that? District 2 City Councilwoman Jada Andrew Sullivan agrees. She says the first step to solving any problem is admitting there is one. Racism is not just something that is is written or it's not just something that we can give a shot for. It is something that is embedded. And until we get down into the root and the core of that, then we start to see a change. Following the lead of more than 80 other cities and counties that have made similar declarations, Andrew Sullivan says the city is working to identify the inequities that continuously put people of color at a disadvantage. We look to our Department of Equity that had the equity atlas, that had the equity maps that show um, what steps we need to truly take. Those inequities bolstered by racism hinder change in our community. Healthcare is a prime example. We know that racism has an impact on individual health for certain, and then when you take that collectively, it's, it's public health. Local epidemiologist Sharice Rohr Allegrini says many people of color lack access to healthy foods, safe parks, and access to health care, which all contribute to poor health. The lack of access can also increase stress. Black people in particular are hit hardest. We have um, higher rates of high blood pressure, diabetes, hypertension. Since making its declaration in August, the city has yet to put forth a concrete action plan. And while Andrew Sullivan says it's something they're working toward, locals are hoping to see some ideas soon, no matter how small. We're not asking for 
the moon and the stars. We're asking for matters. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. As we mentioned, this story is part two of a closer examination of what it means to declare racism a public health crisis. You can find this story along with part one right now on our Voices of a Nation page at ksat.com slash voices. Take a live look outside. Beautiful downtown area, 71 degrees out there. Oh, it just feels so nice outside. I am ready for fall. It kind of almost feels like yeah. fall like. We I don't have, want to say it yeah. is here, but you know, fall like. Yeah, I alluded to that last night when, you know, I said, dare I say, we, we had a taste of fall, you know, the past several days. Even the past five days, we've been running below average in terms of the high temperature. That trend's going to stop here for a few days. Sunny and dry, and we're going to warm up, but then we do have prospects of a cold front in the extended forecast. So let's chat about it right now, starting with a look at our aquifer. I want to give you an update here. We like what that shows. Notice how the 10 day average is above 660. That's important because it gives us the chance of pulling out of stage one restrictions in the foreseeable future here. We're still waiting on word on if or when that could happen, but we'll keep you posted if it does happen. Either way, aquifer in better shape than it was. Late August, September has been decent to us and especially temperature wise lately, but you look at rain chances going forward. Oh, unfortunately, slim to almost none. 10% on Sunday, Tuesday, Wednesday, a 10 to 20% shot. And that would be in response to a cold front that could be headed our way. Our sky is clearing. The clouds in the back end of the remnants of beta clearing out of San Antonio, now moving through East Texas. All the rainfall has since pushed eastward, even exiting Louisiana. Mississippi seeing the brunt of the rain right now and even stretching it to Alabama and Tennessee. But look at the big difference in temperatures today as a result of cloud cover to the east. 72 Dallas, Shreveport 71, even Little Rock only 63. But then you go into West Texas, 90 Marfa, El Paso topped out at 96. So big difference west to east and the temperatures were all sunshine dependent, even in our area. Gonzales topped out at 76 under the clouds, LaGrange 78, but then Del Rio made it up to 94. In San Antonio, we were 83 and that's five degrees below average. The record for the day, 99 set back in 2005. 66 in comfort already. Bulverde at 67, Lost Maple 69, but we do have some areas in low to mid 70s still and even hanging on to 80 degrees, actually 82 in Del Rio. We're all feeling the humidity. I know temperatures are across the board right now, but dew points are for the most part in the mid 60s and this isn't going to change until that cold front would hit us next week. Then as usual, with these fall cold fronts it would sweep away the humidity. So let's talk about it. Temperatures starting with tomorrow morning. 64 in Hondo, upper 50s in the Hill Country, Kerrville, Fredericksburg 59, here in San Antonio 66 along with Beeville. By the afternoon with sunshine, we soar into the 80s, 88 in town, you get into the lower 90s as you head closer to the Rio Grande. Locally, Holotus 86, Timberwood Park 84, and even up to 88 Von Army and La Soya and Lackland area as well. But look at the extended forecast. So with this sunshine, we'll be up near 90 degrees even by Friday, lower 90s this upcoming weekend. Those rain chances are slim. Sunday, maybe a coastal shower popping up. Basically, ignore the rain chances, they're so slim. But then we get into next week and the prospects of that cold front would be about Tuesday, Wednesday time frame. We're pretty confident that we'll see the cold front and that it would arrive here in South Texas. I think the biggest uncertainty is related to its exact timing and then corresponding temperature impacts. But by this time next week, we could have another little taste of fall in the air. There we go. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Adam. All right, a big and therefore noticeable absence at Cowboys practice. Yeah, today. the injury list is actually growing, and we're hoping they're just being conservative at this point since they still have two more days of workouts. And when we come back, that Cowboys injury report, not good. Who is on it? We will show you. And why the Texas Longhorns are very happy. There's 75% less Red Raider fans this coming Saturday in Lubbock. Coming up. Football coverage.
powered by Davis Law Firm. We were waiting to hear if the Cowboys star defensive player would be able to practice after he missed a lot of Sunday showdown with the Atlanta Falcons due to the knee injury, but Demarcus Lawrence did not participate in practice today, according to the Cowboys report to the NFL. That's after he was involved in only 28 snaps versus the Falcons last Sunday with only five tackles. Remember, Tank signed a five-year, $105 million contract extension this offseason with $48 million of that guarantee, but he was not the only one who did not participate today. Neither did star left tackle Tyron Smith, who's dealing with neck issues, or cornerbacks Chidobe Wuze with hamstring issues, or Trayvon Diggs with a shoulder injury. Well, unfortunately, we've had some injuries, but I think you've seen that across the entire league. Everyone's dealing with injuries, and um, you know, I think Coach McCarthy, that he hits that all the time, that it takes everyone on the team. It's not going to be the, the 22 guys starting at the beginning of the year. They're going to take every snap. So I think these coaches do a great job of, of um, emphasizing that. And, you know, I think guys are preparing the right way to, to, be, to be ready to play when their number's called. All right, the Seahawks will be five-point favorites in Sunday in their 325 kickoff against the Cowboys. When the Houston Texans face the Pittsburgh Steelers this Sunday at Heinz Field, it will mark only the third time in the 100-year history that three brothers will play in the same NFL game. J.J. Watt's two brothers both now play for the Steelers. That's after Derek Watt signed with Pittsburgh to join his brother T.J. It truly is incredible. I mean, just to have all of us, you know, playing at Wisconsin was really cool. Just to have all of us playing in the NFL was really cool. Uh, to play against another brother was cool. Now to have all of us on the field at the same time in the same game, um, it really doesn't get any better than that. It's, it's incredible. It's um, special. It's a testament to our parents and everything that they did and all the people in our lives, our coaches, our trainers, everybody who helped us get here. The Texans just need a win after starting their season 0-2 and losses against the Chiefs and the Ravens. Kickoff is set for noon. The Longhorn, Sam Ellinger, has already started his senior season by leading UT the 59-3 route of UTEP two weeks ago at home. In that game, he had career highs with passing of 426 yards and five touchdowns to earn him the Big 12 Offensive Player of the Week. Now, Ellinger will lead the Longhorns in the conference play this Saturday when they travel to Lubbock to face the Texas Tech Red Raiders, who they are limiting the tenants to just 25%. For Ellinger, that's good news. I guess there will, there will be a quarter of amount of tortillas thrown per game uh, on Saturday. So that's kind of unfortunate. Always a great, great time playing up in Lubbock. You know, they're always... A hostile environment and and I expect it to be the same but I guess just at 25 percent all right kickoff in Lubbock on Saturday except for 2 30. what UTSA star quarterback would like to see Friday night in the Alamo Dome next the undefeated UTSA Roadrunners face winless Middle Tennessee Blue Raiders this Friday night in the Alamo Dome to open up Conference USA play. It's an opponent that was secured last Saturday when Memphis had to bow out due to positive coronavirus tests. The Roadrunners are hoping more fans will come out after just over 6,600 fans made it to their home opener against Stephen F. Austin, where they have just they can have just over 11,000 in attendance during the COVID-19 pandemic. I understand it's a pandemic, so uh, everybody will be more spread out and not that many people are going to go. It's kind of quiet at times, uh, but like Coach said, we got to bring our own juice on the sideline, uh, just get motivated by ourselves. Uh, but we appreciate all the fans that came out, and uh, we understand that some fans don't want to come out because of the pandemic, uh, but we just appreciate the, the support and uh, just come out again Friday and get it rocking. All right, after being injured the last two seasons, Frank says he's taking nothing for granted. Kickoff is a Friday, except for 7 p.m. The Peanut Butter Bowl is back this season. This year it involves four big games. Churchill versus Alamo Heights, October the 1st. Seguin against New Braunfels, October the 2nd. Brennan versus Reagan, October 17th. And Johnson against Brandeis on October 22nd. Fans are being asked to bring jars of peanut butter to the games that will be donated to Snack Pack for Kids, San Antonio, Christian Cupboard, and SOS Food Bank. Or you can click on PayPal and donate by credit card. We're doing something that's bigger than us. And we're trying to always tell our student athletes you know, it's, it's about others. It's about doing something with good for the team, what's good for your community. It's a great opportunity for them to get outside themselves and promote uh, for a worthy cause. They understand the things that are going on in today's world. They're, they're, they're very empathetic to it. So for them to have a reason to play uh, more than just for playing for themselves and their, their community, uh, it's pretty important for them. Just a, a great opportunity for our young kids to see what it's like to give back and to be that servant leader that we always talk about. 
And we're getting late word tonight that Bernie Champions game down at Victoria against Victoria West has been called off. Too many positive coronavirus tests in Victoria West and also contact tracing so they can't field a team for the game. So Champion will now host Veterans Memorial Friday at 7 p.m. in Bernie Independent School District Stadium. In just two days, they switched the schedule that quick. I don't, I don't know how they do it. I really don't. That's great. That's amazing. It is. Yeah. Thank you, Greg. It's still ahead on the night beat. This is a live picture from Louisville, Kentucky tonight as we monitor the protests following today's developments in the Breonna Taylor case. The latest coming out. And the pandemic continues to change here at home. Our live case at Q&A with Mayor Ron Nuremberg is coming up next. It's time for our KSAT Q&A, and we are pleased to be joined on most Wednesday nights by San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg, who joins us live tonight as well. Mayor, thank you for staying up with us. And, and what I have on my mind tonight to talk about is the fact that what is playing out in Louisville, Kentucky right now, the fact that the Breonna Taylor case still does not seem to have any resolution to it. Uh, a lot of people feel like they've been let down by the justice system. On the other hand, you have two Louisville officers who were shot tonight during protests in that city. Also something that that the majority of people don't want to see. How do we bring these two sides together when it seems like people are are choosing one side or the other uh, when really improvements can be made on both sides? Yeah, and I think there's really at the end of the day only one side to this, and that is the side of justice. And in a broken criminal justice system, that's hard to come by, uh, especially for communities of color. And I think that's the frustration that you're seeing play out in Louisville. Um, you know, the, the, the feelings are pretty raw, and it's a sad day in America because we also now have two uh, police officers who were shot in that city. Um, you know, uh, there's no easy answers, but what I will say is that this, uh, again, is indicative of a criminal justice system that does not work fairly for everyone. Um, and, and it's not just about police reform. It's also about the entire criminal justice system and how we deliver uh, justice for people who have been victims of crime or uh, find themselves, uh, you know, bystanders in crime. Uh, you know, I will say the Breonna Taylor case is about um, is prime is in part about the use of no-knock warrants in policing. And as you know, uh, here in San Antonio, we've had a long uh, discussion over the summer about police reform, use of force, and other policies. And Chief McManus, uh, a couple weeks ago, banned no-knock warrants. Hadn't been used, but for isolated cases uh, for a while, but there is now a an outright ban on no-knock warrants. So hopefully we don't see that kind of situation play out in San Antonio. It, the, the dichotomy, though, that, that we were talking about plays out across San Antonio because we had the, the last bare facts uh, Revolver right. Report KSAT poll we had uh, showed the fact that the majority of people supported police, but the majority of people also supported reform. Right. Yeah, and, and it's not either or. I think you, you can support police, but you, you also support reform if you do that in a just manner. And, and San Antonio is not immune. Uh, you know, we do have work to do, and we have been identifying those with the community, with our police department, and we've been, uh, for the most part, working together to achieve those reforms. Part of that is use of force policy review. Part of it is transparency and accountability, things like the police body cam uh, policy that we talked about um, earlier today. Uh, and part of it is reform of the accountability measures that are in the collective bargaining agreement, which uh, unfortunately tilt towards uh, the uh, tilt towards the um, uh, officers who have been accused and, and have found misconduct going back on the force. We need to make sure that our chief executive in the police department, that is the chief of police, William McManus, has the ability to weed out um, officers who um, have been found in misconduct. M Mr. Mayor, speaking of policing and some of those policies, you recently uh, called for a complete review of the police department's body-worn camera policy. Right. Talk to us about that. What is the timeline for that and what does that review entail? Well, it's underway right now, and it, and it starts with um, 
you know, the, the city attorney's office, the police department and our city council. And we will be getting together to discuss um, the needed policy for police cam um, re release and use. Uh, and the purpose for that is to, uh, again, uh, augment accountability measures that uh, not only we have internally as a, as a city organization, but also the public. Uh, you know, we need to make sure that there's clear expectations and a written policy that's public uh, for the release of body cam footage. So we're not going from one incident to the next. Body cams are uh, and footage from body cams are used in evidence. So we need to make sure that, uh, you know, in, in cases of, of an investigation, that uh, that is not um, that is not compromised in any way. But Body cam footage is part of public record that needs to uh, uh, shed light on incidents that that uh, ha deserve and have come under increased scrutiny. I want to switch gears here. We're less than two weeks away from early voting beginning uh, in the state of Texas and a couple of propositions that have to do with the one eight cent sales tax that goes to Aqua yeah. for protection right now. You're asking that it be shifted to the workforce development projects uh, to help with people who have lost their jobs in the middle yeah. of this pandemic. There are people lining up that are, that are criticizing both of the, that measure and then the VIA measure that would follow it in five years. Your answer to them, first off, when it comes to workforce development, and then I, I want to pose a, the question about VIA to you as well. Sure, um, so let's make sure we've got the facts straight. Number one, this is not a new tax. This is not an increase in tax. This is a, a reallocation of existing revenues. Uh, from the uh, programs that you mentioned. The Edwards Aquifer Protection Program is now funded for 10 years through, a, through, this, through the city. So the sales tax, which you are currently paying, now can go towards helping people who have been devastated. Our neighbors, 150,000 of our neighbors have been truly devastated by this pandemic or out of work, and we want to help them. We need to get our community back on its feet. This is about families in our community who have been devastated by a global pandemic. And we're going to take the next four years to help people get back to work. Um, you know, rallying around our neighbors in need is something that San Antonio does very well. And this is an emergency. We've got to do it. And I'm not one to sit on my hands waiting for something to happen. We need to help people in need. I want to talk about VIA now. Well, we, we heard uh, Councilman Clayton Perry bring it up. Uh, I heard Trish DeBerry bring it up in a debate that we hosted last night. And your former opponent, Greg Brockhouse, brought it up again. Why are we voting on uh, via for the future of mass transit when we don't know what that's going to look like five, ten, eight years from now. Yeah, and, and we don't know entirely what the future holds with regard to transportation innovation, but one thing we do know for sure is that people depend on public transportation. In fact, some of uh, the, the, the a great majority of service workers uh, make up the majority of our ridership on VIA. And VIA happens to be uh, the one of the poorest funded transit systems in the nation. They've done more with less and our, our city is growing, our congestion is growing. And if we want to control that congestion and also be able to get people to work in an equitable manner, we've got to really uh, work on expansion of our public transportation system to allow people to get to work who depend on VIA and also to give people options. And again, we're doing all of this in the middle of a pandemic, helping people, helping our neighbors without raising taxes. Um, you know, San Antonio knows how to rally. We knew how to respond in crisis, and that's exactly what this November election, election is all about. Mayor Rod Nuremberg, thank you so much for your time tonight. We appreciate it. Anytime. Great to be with you all. Thank you. We'll be right back. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather, streaming free on KSAT TV. It started off as a small, intimate ceremony to honor the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Now it is the public's turn to mourn and say goodbye. For the next two days, Ginsburg's casket will sit on the steps of the Supreme Court draped in an American flag. President Donald Trump will pay his respects tomorrow while a tumultuous political fight grips Capitol Hill. Republicans moving ahead to fill Ginsburg's seat before the election. ABC's Andrew Dimbert has the latest from Washington, D.C. 
After decades championing civil and women's rights in the hallowed halls of the nation's highest court, the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg honored today in the place she served for 27 years. Her casket arriving at the Supreme Court for her memorial service. The eight remaining justices together for the first time since the COVID pandemic began to mourn the loss of an institutional icon and colleague. Among the words that best describe Ruth, tough, brave, a fighter, a winner. President Bill Clinton, who appointed Ginsburg to the bench, paying his respects today. Tomorrow, President Trump will do the same. But alongside the tributes and solemn celebration, a nasty political fight is unfolding from Capitol Hill to the White House. Republicans should for once be straight with the American people. They are fighting to reverse Judge Ginsburg's legacy, not honor it. The president and GOP-led Senate are moving forward to fill Ginsburg's seat before the November election. I can only repeat that uh, we have an obligation under the Constitution, should we choose to take advantage of it, uh, to fill the vacancy. Democrats slamming their rivals across the aisle, accusing the Republicans of hypocrisy. Just four years ago, when President Obama sought to replace the late Justice Antonin Scalia, Republicans stopped the nomination, claiming it was too close to an election. That was nine months before voters went to the polls. This time, it's not even nine weeks. But the party insists this time is different because Republicans control the Senate and the White House. Saturday at 5 o'clock in the Rose Garden, where I'll be putting forth my nominee for Supreme Court Justice. On Friday, Ginsburg will lie in state at the Capitol, the first woman ever to do so. And then just a day later, President Trump will announce his pick to fill her seat. Ginsburg, meanwhile, her final resting place will be at the Arlington National Cemetery. Her funeral is next week. She'll be buried next to her husband. Andrew Dimbert, ABC News, the Supreme Court. And our coverage continues in the Breonna Taylor case. Here is a live look in Louisville, Kentucky, where law enforcement dispersed crowds of protesters after two officers were shot. One officer is alert and stable. The other is in surgery. And one suspect, meantime, is in custody. Protesters filled the streets after a grand jury decided to charge only one of the police officers after the death of Breonna Taylor. Some of those protesters have been detained. Live cam tonight as the temperature continues to go down. We're going to be in the 60s here before we know it. And, you know, I am I think I said it the other night. I'm glad the triple digits are <laughs> seemingly behind us. Yeah, it's that time of year where if we hit 100, usually it's a record-breaking day. And there's no sign of triple digits anytime soon. It can still happen this time of year, but it becomes less and less likely, especially with the kind of weather pattern that we're going to be getting into by about this time next week. The aquifer down a little bit today, a tenth of a foot. We're still about three and a half feet above the average for this time of year. Stage one watering restrictions remain, though. Ragweed moderate and mold on the low end. Let's talk a little bit about our rainfall so far this year and of course so far for the month of September. Take a look at that information and for San Antonio, of course measured at the airport, over three inches in September. That's about three quarters of an inch above average month to date. It's been good to us so far but the outlook is pretty bleak here over the next seven days. Since January 1st, we've had a little over 18 inches of precip, and that's five inches below average a year to date. So obviously we could use a little bit more in order to get back up to that average point, but at least the aquifer is has responded to recent rainfall and the 10 day average is back up above 660. 71 degrees right now, dew point is 64. Light northeasterly breeze and the wind has really subsided and it's basically becoming calm tonight. Whereas yesterday we had some decent gusts out there in the past couple of days. It was a little breezy just because of beta being so close to us. But now that beta is out of here and the remnants of it moving off into Louisiana and parts of the southeastern states, our wind has subsided. It's a beautiful evening right near 70 degrees around Bear County. We're 71 in Holotus, Port S.A. at 72. Randolph 69 along with New Braunfels and already 65 in comfort. Still a little bit warmer where we hit the low 90s earlier today, right around the 80 degree mark at this hour. So quiet weather across the state. The remnants of beta started to move into the southeastern United States and the Mid-South. I want to talk about the big picture and the overall weather pattern that we're going to be getting into. Notice as we go through the weekend, still quiet, but what really stands out to me is all signs are pointing toward this big dip in the upper level flow come early next week. On the flip side, the big bump on the west coast. 
Western Ridge, Eastern Trough. Classic setup here, and what this does is it favors colder air to spill down the plains and even make it here to South Texas. Of course, the core of it's going to be up around the Great Lakes, but this type of fat pattern favors cooler air and more fall like conditions. That would be by about this time next week. So a lot to keep an eye on and keep track of between now and then. Otherwise, tomorrow morning, partly cloudy 66, then sunny and 88 by the afternoon, a light north northeasterly breeze. We look at very slim rain chances here and there. Sunday, a 10% chance, middle of next week, another 10% chance. So the main focus is temperatures back in the lower 90s for the weekend, and then we could see temperatures take a bigger hit by this time next week. So something to look forward to if you like that pumpkin spice mm -hmm. weather. <laughs> for yes, some people, it's I already do. here, you know. True. The pumpkin spice lattes are already <laughs> in vogue here for some people. Walmart is preparing for the holiday season while testing out its technology amid the pandemic. Their plans moving forward coming up. And we take a look at the history behind the local town of Katerina. Its ties to a U.S. president coming up. And one state moving to change the car market while combating climate change. The executive order coming out of California. Next on the Night Beat. Cars and climate change. It's what led California's governor to sign an executive order requiring all cars sold in California to be zero emission by 2035. California Governor Gavin Newsom says a move towards a clear, clear, cleaner environment is not a partisan issue. We believe what we're doing here today will substantially enhance and advance the economic competitiveness of American manufacturers, American automobile manufacturers. The California governor says green vehicles are the next big global industry. California has already main, mandated that all trucks sold in that state must be zero emission by 2045. Uncle Ben's rice products are getting a name change. They are now Ben's Original. And the packaged logo that depicted a Chicago head waiter is now being dropped. The changes are set to be on shelves next year. It's part of a broader movement about racial equality and racial stereotypes. In June, several companies said they would retire or rebrand their products. Walmart testing out drone deliveries of home coronavirus test kits. It launched a pilot program this week. The drones drop off tests at homes within a one mile radius of its store in North Las Vegas. It plans to expand the drone trial to Cheektowaga, New York. That's just outside of Buffalo in early October. Customers get a text from drone up when the Quest Diagnostics test is on its way. The samples can then be sent to FedEx to a Quest lab, which will send out results digitally. Meantime, Walmart is also preparing to hire more than 20,000 seasonal employees, each one working outside of the store. Walmart says they will be part of their e-commerce fulfillment centers across the country. The company says to see the spike in online shopping they expect this year and plan to spread traditional Black Friday deals throughout the season. Well, here at home, our Justin Horn spent years digging into the history behind the hundreds of communities in our area, learning how they got their name. This time he added, or he headed, that is, southwest to the town of Katerina in Dimmitt County, which has a tie to a U.S. president. Like many South Texas towns, Katerina has withered with time. But these wide open pastures were once seen as an opportunity. Through a winding history of land grabs and ranching, one of the early landowners in this area was Charles Taft, the 27th president William Howard Taft's half-brother. He would build the famous Taft Summer House, and as the legend goes, complete with oversized bathtubs for his portly brother. Others would follow. Wanted to build a small railroad that linked Asherton to Artesia Wells. That railroad combined with a planned development, a common occurrence in the early 1900s in Southwest Texas, gave Katerina Farms, or just Katerina, a promising start. Roads, sidewalks, new homes, palm trees, the promise of water. It was a virtual oasis. And it even boasted a clubhouse and a large pool. In fact, at the time, it was one of the largest pools in South Texas. The pool is still here, but it's a shell of what it once was. And at the time, the pressure of the aquifer would shoot water out about 15 feet up in the air. It drew in people from all over the country. When you came in as a buyer, you would generally come in from out of state. You came in on the railroad. 
They had built the Katerina Hotel as part of the real estate project. The hotel would become a staple of Katerina and eventually a state historical site. There were even legends that it was haunted. Now it's heavily damaged. A fire destroyed the iconic building earlier this year. Also of note, the town was located on the famed Camino Real, and that's probably how it got its name. It had to do with the Mexican girl that either lived on the Katerina Ranch or was killed by Indians. Water availability would dry up here, many eventually moving away. The famous Taft House left in tatters. It was a uh, very much run down, kind of fallen apart house. That is until another well-known family decided to move the house to their nearby ranch. In the 80s, they moved it there, I guess from Catalina, the kind of town where it was, to the ranch headquarters. Former Texas Governor Dolph Briscoe and his wife Janie saw the historical significance. Dolph Briscoe IV. In the 1990s, um, my grandfather and grandmother started renovating it and really fixing it up. The house remains in the Briscoe's possession, a reminder of what was once the thriving South Texas town of Katerina. Justin Horn, KSAT 12 News. A fifth grader from Texas is the winner of the annual Doodle for Google contest. If you were on the search engine's homepage today, you saw Sharon Sarah's winning artwork. Her doodle is called Together as One. It shows a group of six friends with various skin tones, hair, fashion styles, all holding hands. The North Texas Elementary student was awarded a $30,000 college scholarship. That's nice. Her school will get a $50,000 wow. technology package. The Doodle for Google contest has been going strong since 2008. That's really neat. That's a gr yes. pretty cool doodle. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not a very Nor am accomplished I. artist. No. Mine would be stick figures. Stick, yeah. stick <laughs> figures, right? right? So in the Hill Country tomorrow morning, we'll start the day in the upper 50s, mid 60s. Elsewhere by the afternoon, we'll be well into the 80s. Basically, not much happening until maybe the middle of next week. Cold front possible. Okay. Thank you, Adam. GMSA at 430. Good night.